we're going to take a little trip together. You okay with that? Everybody got their bags packed? Because I want to take us on a little trip. I want to take us to Rome. I want to take us back in time. Not quite 2,000 years back in time. In fact, I don't just want to take us to Rome. I want to take you to the catacombs. And I want you to find there an early church gathering. Find yourself in that place. Feel the coolness, the dim light of candle. Find yourself amongst other believers in that place who have gathered to break bread together, to share the communion cup, to pray and laugh and live together, to read the stories of the prophets and read the books of Moses, to share letters circulated amongst these earliest churches. Imagine yourself there in that place. This is not taking place in some grand cathedral or even in someone's home. It is taking place underground because this gathering is still something of an illegal religion in Rome. Sometimes persecuted, sometimes ignored, but it's better to err on the side of caution. So this earliest Christian community that you have visited meets in the catacombs. And when they sing together, the resonance is something of beauty. And then somebody walks in. Somebody who has not been part of this group before walks in carrying a bound group of papyrus filled with writing. Some of the people in this setting, they're a little nervous to welcome somebody new into their midst. Strangers can be dangerous when you're in illegal religion. But this stranger walks into the middle of the gathering, holds those papers in front of him, and begins to read, saying the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. All right, travel back to Oneonta, 21st century. When I think about what it must have been like to be the first group of Christians to receive the first gospel writings, that's kind of what I imagine might have happened. These groups that had been gathering together now for several decades now had something written down. And the first thing that they had written down in terms of a gospel said, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Before that, the phrase good news had been reserved for Caesar. Caesar would declare it good news when the empire conquered a new land, won an impressive battle. But now it was good news of Jesus Christ. And for a community that was struggling, persecuted, and probably more than a little overwhelmed at times, those first words of that first gospel must have sounded like hope. You ever notice when writing something down makes it seem a little bit more real? When having something physical in front of you makes it more real? I feel maybe that's what happened in these earliest Christian communities. When they started to write things down, when they started to record the good news, not just for them, but for their children and their children's children, I imagine that must have made the hope of Jesus Christ a little more real. So today is the first Sunday of Advent. We have decorated our sanctuary. We have started our Advent wreath. 
We have heard some of the traditional first Sunday of Advent readings. And boy, are they a doozy. We don't start Advent off with, you know, beauty or, you know, that snuggly little baby Jesus or the glory of Mary. We start with some seemingly hopeless texts. The psalm that we read together, it's known as a psalm of lament. That's not a psalm of praise. That's a psalm of lament. The epistle reading is coming from a community facing oppression. And our gospel reading starts off by talking about going through days of suffering. None of these are nice, you know, comforting passages to start off Advent with. But every year we come back to the same themes on this first Sunday of Advent. This is not supposed to be a comfortable place to live. Fuk Lu, the presenter in our Digging Deeper in Sunday School class, talks about two stories at Christmas time. There's the baby Jesus story, and then there's the coming of Christ story. And he says that we get a lot more comfortable with the baby Jesus story than we do the coming of Christ story. I put my uh, manger scene up yesterday at home. And I've got the Peanuts manger scene. So Charlie Brown is there as Joseph. Lucy, of course, is Mary. Um, Snoopy is one of the sheep. Woodstock is the baby Jesus. I'm missing somebody. Linus is a shepherd. That's a very comfortable story, the baby Jesus story. We get very comfortable with that one. That's a, that's a beautiful story. But the coming of Christ story is the more powerful story, I think. But it's also the one that's more challenging because it overturns everything that we thought was secure in this world. It changes everything, and change can be hard. The coming of Christ is not a comfortable story. Why do we start in this place? Why do we start in this area of tension, of discomfort? Isn't this the season of wonder? Isn't this a time of splendor, beauty? Isn't this the time of hope? Why do we start off in such a place that seems devoid of hope. We might as well ask the question, why would God choose to enter the world in such a lowly state? Why doesn't God choose to come in triumph with trumpet blasts? Why not be born into the palace of the emperor? with servants ready to wait hand and foot upon the child? Why does God choose to be born into poverty? Why does God choose a life of homelessness? Why? I think first we might say that it is in the places where we are most likely to experience hopelessness, where God meets us. God enters into the hardest, the cruelest, the most inhumane places of the world, because that is precisely where we need to experience God the most. But maybe, just maybe, God enters into those desperate places 
to remind us of something that is both wonderful and powerful. To remind us that we, you and I, are called to bring hope into the world. And I say bring hope. Because a lot of times what we want to do is we want to offer hope. We want to offer that nice, comfortable platitude of hope that, oh, things will get better, don't worry about it. I've met that a lot with people that work in ministry and hospital settings. They want to offer that quick platitude of hope, even when things seem bleakest. We're not simply called to offer hope as a soothing balm for those who are hurting in this world. We are called as the body of Christ to bring hope into the world. As the body of Christ, it is our calling maybe our most sacred calling, to bring hope into the hopeless areas of the world. It was several years back, and I say several, definitely more than 10, not more than 20. Several years back, I came across a poem by Howard Thurman, the great civil rights leader. It's called The Work of Christmas. I've shared it every year I've been in ministry in one way or another because I think it speaks to the deepest calling of what it means not only to be a Christian in the world today, but to be a, some, a person who celebrates Christmas this year. It goes like this. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, When the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. Maybe that is the simplest thing we can say of what it means to bring hope into the world. Not to just cover up the suffering. Not to offer some blind optimism. But to actually get out into the world, finding the lost, healing the broken, feeding the hungry, releasing the prisoner, rebuilding the nations, bringing peace among people, and making music in the heart. That is my definition of hope. The beautiful work of Christmas is the work of hope, bringing wholeness to all the broken places in the world. And maybe that's why we start off in this place of discomfort. A reminder to us, that there are broken places in the world. And part of our mission, maybe the biggest part of our mission, is bringing hope to those places. Let's pray together. Lord, give us the courage. Give us the courage to walk into the world. Give us the courage to bring hope. Not to speak of hope, not to offer words of hope, but to bring physical embodiments of hope into a world that desperately needs it. Lord, this is our prayer today. Amen.